Good morning and uh, welcome to our session, Healthy Oceans and Sustainable Trade. We have with us uh, today um, Carmen Ablan from De La Salle University in the Philippines and Suti Korn Kinkaev, um, advisor in the KBU Research Institute in Thailand. Um, our oceans uh, are the backstone of global commerce, yet they are increasingly under pressure from industries overfishing, uh, unsustainable trade. Today in our session we will explore how innovation, how knowledge and policy can work together to ensure that our ocean economies remain both ecologically resilient and economically viable. Um, Dr. Ablan, Carmen, I will start uh, with you. Your work connects traditional maritime knowledge and uh, with modern innovation and government frameworks. From your experience, um, how can we actually, um, how can actually local ocean stewardship and community wisdom shape modern approaches to sustainable ocean management? Uh, the Philippines has traditionally been um, maritime and economy, in, but the contribution of the maritime economy to the national GDP is quite low. But at the local level, however, we have had a lot of successes in terms of managing fisheries and involving local communities, having been at the forefront of marine protected area protection it's ever since uh, maybe, I guess, in the 80s. So we have a lot of examples of how coastal communities in fisheries have actually also transitioned into saving and protecting the environment and being part of the tourism industry. And that is, I guess, one of the major innovations that the Philippines has actually been at the forefront of. These local communities have now had national legislation that requires 20% of their coastal habitats to be protected. And that has also created a lot of jobs for these um, people who normally would be exploiting fisheries at the near shore. So I guess we can say that local governance is very strong in our country and the creation of policies that basically protect coastal habitats and fisheries has been having so much success in the recent years. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, Shutikorn, coming to you, um, I want to bring also the issue of um, carbon management and marine ecosystem in, your, in the discussion. From your perspective, which are the biggest opportunities and risks emerging from uh, new ocean technologies such as blue carbon, marine biotechnology, etc.? And to, of course, also, um, uh, since you have the floor, also the issue of local stewardship and communities that uh, Carmen addressed is... Uh, also question. Thank you. Thank you, Konstantinos. Um, for me, I mean, emerging blue technologies open a new frontier for ocean positive growth, but they also carry a new risk and, for example, like exclusions and exploitation for local communities. So what are those opportunities? I mean, for example, marine biotechnologies can provide sustainable biomaterials, nutraceuticals, medical compounds, and reducing pressures on wild stocks. So you can create a new um, technology, biotechnology that help um, the local stock, local fishery stock flourish as well. Blue carbon ecosystem, mangroves, sea grasses, salt meshes create measurable carbon sinks that connect local conservation and global finance. Decarbonized shipping can cut global emissions while modernizing ports and logistics for the low carbon economies. But these are some opportunities that blue economy can create, blue technology can create. But also there are risks. If we don't manage it well, there are plenty of risks that we have to uh, moderate. For example, like without equity safeguards, we risk blue grabbing. Blue grabbing is like all those natural resources in the oceans are exploited patent, profit, and benefit by some outsiders or external uh, entities. Carbon credit scheme may undervalue local stewardship or commodify ecosystems without community benefits. Technology gaps between nations could widen in innovations if innovation is not open and accessible. So the way forward is inclusive innovations, open data, fair benefit, sharing under the Nagoya protocol. This is something that I think is will help 
um, helping the local communities instead of having outsider to exploit the marine natural resource we share the benefit between the local community the custodian of the natural resource and the outsider who research on it who use it who benefit from it this is something i think um, will help sharing the benefit with the local communities i would agree with that and that is very difficult because right now how local communities perceive resources and how these new emerging technologies are unfolding will require local buy-in, local training, and local access to information as well. I would particularly be more um, adamant about things like fintech, to be inclusive of local communities so that they can access uh, markets directly. I would think of processing, because processing will add value to this. And how do you involve local communities in that? For biotechnology, it's a numbers game. And in the Philippines, we have traditionally been very, very strict about access to biodiversity. But we need a lot of that going on at the same time. So there is a, a balance that has to be met in that area. And finally, the carbon discussion. I don't think local communities are very much aware about how this actually works and therefore they will definitely, without effort from all of us, be excluded in the process. Sure, I think I agree with Carmen. And I think we, we need to build a win-win situation for both uh, local communities and the one who come in with the technology, with the resource, with the finance and so on. So this is something that, I mean, uh, lo local government administrations, they need to put in place measures or policy to have a like, co-design co-develop and co-management between the local community and external entity to come in. Why we need local community is because they're there. They know they have knowledge of the area because they are the one who can help with the precision of the implementations. So without local community, without local expert, external entity who come in may not manage it well, may miss the precision, may miss the efficiency and so on. This is something that the local community will have to show their value back to those external <coughs> entities that coming in that they can help create a better model for everyone. Thank you. Uh, if I may to bring uh, another question to both of you. International trade is an issue that uh, is very high on the agenda, in the international agenda lately. And I want to ask you, how can international trade frameworks and investment policies that we all of us are talking about the whole time um, help actually to better balance economic livelihoods, but at the same time are connected with the ocean health, and especially with in maritime ecosystems that um, rely heavily on, si on shipping, on fisheries, tourism as well. Okay. Uh, sure. Trade is one important issue that, that utilize um, blue economy. I mean, trade route, ports, and so on. If we don't manage it well, if we don't uh, do it in a sustainable way, then it will affect um, not only those local communities, but also the whole trade route. I mean, we are implementing uh, carbon reductions carbon credit, and so on. So this is something that um, those stakeholders, those entities have to take into account. And also, I want, I want to point out that um, it's not just the um, blue economy that affects the local community, but it's also affect the whole supply chain and value chains of related industries. For example, in, in Thailand, for example, we have a large seafood export industries. And when we're talking about farming, fishery, blue economies, it doesn't only stop there, but it's also have a long chain of supply and value that create to local labor, local immigrant laborers, and also up to the supermarket and outside to export market. This is something that we have to make sure that is all aligned with the sustainable practice. And one thing I want to point out is a lot of sustainable standard or um, certifications are from developed countries. And it's very expensive 
when you're talking to local farming, fishery farming, they say that, okay, it's very expensive for us to get this done and it's not possible. Even though we want to practice that, we want to do that, but, but the, the amount of the certification fee is very high. So this is something that I think we should address that to make it more accessible for local farm, fishery farming as well. I would say that the um, international standards and the certification schemes would have examples in the Philippines that are, you know, stellar in the sense like, for example, Marine, uh, Marine Stewardship Council certification for handline tuna fishing. They have this in one of the areas in the Philippines, and it has worked very well in terms of dealing with traditional knowledge and practice. The other thing that I would like to point out is the Shargao, for example, is an island and they have elevated their mangroves into a, a heritage level. This kinds of international discussions and certifications and branding, I'd say, has protection in terms of local changes in administration. Because a lot of the Philippines is actually dependent on local leadership. And there is a turnover that can be very fast. But if you elevate your practice or your market or like a heritage site, it isn't very easy for somebody to just come along and change that. And therefore, that has worked very well, I guess, for many of the resources that are in the coastal areas in my country. Thank you. Um, both of you mentioned a lot of the issue of farming and fisheries. And um, I want to ask, I want to bring also um, the issue of circularity in the discussion. How important is circular aquaculture? And um, what can be done differently than before when it comes to circular economy and how it is, uh, goes hand to hand with the uh, blue economy? Carmen, please. Um, I can start. Um, the, the traditional agriculture in the Philippines is basically five species. It says mangrove crabs, shrimp, seaweed, tilapia, and milkfish. And I don't think many of these, tradi these areas of production, except for seaweed, would be amenable for coastal fishers. And I'm talking about 1.1 million people who will be at risk when resources go down and are actually exploiting this resource. So there are, however, traditional practices and there are like fermentation and there's an effort to basically offshore aquaculture. What it really needs to do is diversify. That's what I'm gonna say. Diversify in terms of the emerging markets and methods to take care of livelihoods and employment. At the same time, introducing this, because aquaculture is basically seen as a negatively dirty industry. But if we are able to turn that around, then they would actually be more amenable to practices that will build on local livelihoods as well. Constantinos, I think circular economy is very important. I mean, when you go back in history, aquaculture is happening uh, in some place like Hawaii. 100, 200 years ago, and they, they do it in the way that very less uh, yeah. dense, very natural. For example, they let the small fish come in with the sieving, and then the big fish cannot come in. So they, they and then they fill the, the pond with the sea waters, and then let the nature grow the fish, and then they catch it for both fish and shrimps. This is something that um, happens, but now it's industrialized already. And this is something that changed the whole pictures. And circular economy can come back in and try to push it back to the way it was. I mean, more natural. But one issue is that we, we have to concern is the, the cost effectiveness of, of the old traditional ways. It's not cost effective. So that's why we, we not only pushing farmer or fishery farming to do it, but we also have to create the value chain or supply chain that allow the value to go back to the farming because it's gonna be very expensive per fish, per shrimps. If you don't have those buyers who are willing to pay for it, then it's not gonna happen. So this is the whole restructure of the value chain back to the importing country in developed country and so on. So this is not just circular economy locally, but circular economy throughout the supply chain process? I would say one of the biggest um, inputs to aquaculture is feeds. 
And the biggest input to feeds is protein. And that would then mean finding, you know, the traditional anchoveta fishery for the fish feed and all. But that's where circular economy can come in. Because alternative protein strategies, I am a biotechnologist by training, can actually be coming from uh, industry discards and the things that are actually found in the processing of food in the industry. So this is where new technologies have to come in. Development of alternative proteins for the feed industry to be able to deal with the problem of feeds in aquaculture. I think we have time for a final round of remarks. Sudkorn, do you want to start? I think uh, to create blue economy, uh, I would emphasize the fact that we have to do core design, co-develop the measures and co-management not just the external or government, the external entity and government coming in and do the top-down approach. But we also need the engagement of local community from the start, from designing the measures, develop and implementations and managing it. So this is something I think we will have a sustainable outcome. For me, I think the discussion in blue economy will forget the small coastal community and coastal fisher. When we talk about minerals, when we talk about resources and oil and gas, we're, we, we will be missing out on a group of individuals that have been marginally, marginalized generationally. And therefore, we have to give them voice, which then means that they should be part of the, the discussion of how the economy will then change into transitions that will then provide them jobs and livelihoods at the same time. And therefore, I guess I'm, that's what I'm here for. It's to raise that banner for that kind of communities that are actually found on the coastal zones, which have poverty levels actually double of the national averages, and they're growing. Thank you. Thank you both. A common thread that um, stands from our conversation today is that innovation must be rooted in local communities, must be also rooted in stewardship. Uh, to make trade and sustainability compatible, we must integrate um, local knowledge and um, technological advancement, but also sound governors. Uh, because healthy oceans, at the end of the day, is the foundation also of healthy economies. Thank you.